Good morning, Good Life family. My name is David. I'm excited that we're here for another Sunday. Um, we're still here. We're still concerned with online services and doing them well and presenting them to you because we know that for some of you, you just feel more comfortable staying home or for you're traveling or whatever it may be, we're just excited that we get to share life, even if it's through a screen. Um, at Good Life, it's really important for us to not only preach the good news, but to share life as well. And during these crazy times, sharing life looks really different. But this is one way that we can do it, is to worship together. Another way that we can do it is, is to communicate together. So find us online on our social media. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what God's doing in your heart or any prayer requests that you have. You can always email us as well at info at goodlifefl.com or find us on our website at goodlifefl.com as well. Um, all the information that you might need to help you share life during this time will be there. But I just wanna encourage you as we go into this worship, even though it's in front of a screen, um, set your mind and your heart on Jesus. I know it's difficult. I have kids and doing things online and in front of a screen is difficult, but I just I pray that you would take a moment together with me just to set your mind on Jesus. So let me pray. Father, I thank you for how you love us. I thank you that when we feel like life is crazy and wild and loud and we can't focus, that you are able to come in and to show us peace and to do the impossible. I pray that you would ready our minds and our hearts this morning for you, that we would hear from you, that we would engage with you, that the craziness of our lives, um, the stress of our work, um, just the stress of this time and this season of life, that you would steady the ship, steady our minds and our hearts on you. Father, we pray these things in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Do you feel the world's broken? Feel the shadows deepen. Do. do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. do you wish that you could see it all made? It's all creation groaning. It is. It is a new creation coming. It is. This is glory. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is. It isn't good that we remind ourselves of Clear this. this is our God, He's worthy. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, the conqueror in the grave. He is David's root in the land who died. To ransom the slave Is he worthy Is he worthy Of our blessing and honor and glory Is he worthy Of this He is Can we declare this truth about our God does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. I love this. And does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, the conqueror, the grave. He is David's root in the land who died to ransom the 
You took the sinner's place. He sings the symphony of grace. And while Satan's lies and guilt abound, the Savior's love resounds. He's holy and holy, holy, holy. Is our God worthy? Worthy is Christ the Lamb. All my heart, all my soul, all my life is yours, the Lord. Holy is our God. Heaven's throne above I hear A voice that silences all fear Amen. It's a declaration of a king It says you are mine and you are free We declare it again we look forward to. And he will return just as he said. The day the graves give up their dead. Amen. And I will rise to the ground and sing the sweetest song. In holy Lord, sing Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy is Christ the Lamb. You're holy, 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 holy is our God. Worthy, worthy is Christ the Lamb. You're holy, holy. Oh, my heart, 
All my soul, all my life is yours alone. Holy is your God. You holy Lord. Yeah, so we sing, we sing. Oh, 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 oh. confess and declare, Jesus, that you're holy and you're worthy. We give you all the praise and we worship in your name. Amen. Have you ever felt like you're on the outside looking in? It happens a lot through life. Like think back to kindergarten and you just wanted those kids to let you play with them on the playground. Or maybe those turbulent middle school years when you may have a friend in first hour, by lunchtime you're mortal enemies. And once you survive middle school and high school, you get to enjoy the emotional gauntlet of those college rejection letters. The thanks for applying, but we're sorry to inform you, you're not accepted. We only end up growing up through those stages to maybe apply for our dream job, just hoping and praying that they'll accept us and say yes. And let's not even dive into the ups and downs of romantic relationships. In the background of every single one of those moments, there's a part of us that just wants to be accepted. We wanna know what it takes to make the cut. We wanna know what we have to do, what we have to say, who we have to be to find that acceptance that we're looking for. Now, I believe that same wiring that drives our earthly relationships, I think it also influences our interactions with our Heavenly Father. Now, we know something's not quite right. There's something not quite right in our world. And also in our hearts, we know something is missing. But after all the highs and lows of human interactions, we wonder, really, like, what would it take for our Heavenly Father to accept us? We're in the midst of a series entitled All About Jesus, walking verse by verse through the book of Colossians. And last week, we encountered a life-changing truth and a life-shaping challenge. The truth was found in God's answer to that eternal problem, the answer to the mystery of how a holy God was going to make a way for his sinful creation to come to him and find acceptance in him. And the life-changing solution to that mystery was simply this, Christ in you the hope of glory, that Jesus did what we couldn't do to gain the acceptance that we couldn't earn. And the life-shaping challenge that comes comes into our lives is how we're going to react to that truth. The challenging question that we confronted is, is Jesus important enough for you to deny yourself? And if we believe Jesus is our only hope, then the foundation and the focus of our lives is going to be all about him. But taking that truth and taking that challenge and applying them practically to our everyday lives, it's no small task. And if we fail to grasp and we fail to live these things out, we're going to feel like we're always on the outside looking in. We're going to feel like, we're, like we never measure up. And it's going to be far more consequential than recess and resume. So if you would, join me in Colossians chapter 2 as we dive into Paul's practical guide of what it looks like for our lives to be all about Jesus. Join me in Colossians chapter two. Let's begin at verse six. It says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So Paul starts this section with the word therefore. So he's saying that based on everything that I've said so far about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, since all of that is true, now what? What are we supposed to do with this? So Paul says, if you really believe this, that Jesus is supreme and sufficient, then walk in him, live in him. To walk in him means to live like Jesus is Lord of your life. Not pretending, but living that way. This walking with Jesus happens when three things are present and active in our life. In this verse, he talks about being rooted and built up. But walking with Jesus, it doesn't just mean that our roots go deep into him. It's part of it. But what it really means is that he is our root. 
He is the vine. We are the branches. And apart from him, we can do nothing. And when we are rooted and built up in Christ, then we can be established. The word also can be translated strengthened in the faith. Now, the enemy, he wants us to feel like we need to add something to our faith. But what will happen then is our faith will be weakened. But when we walk in Christ, then our faith is strengthened by Christ. And because of that, we can do the third thing. We can abound in thanksgiving. This is one of Paul's favorite phrases. The literal meaning of the phrase is to be overflowing, like a river busting out of its banks. But most people, we live lives that are the exact opposite. We don't abound in thanksgiving. We abound in complaints and offenses and really outrage. Like if there's any word that embodies our modern times, it's the word ungrateful. And I believe being thankless, it leaves us very vulnerable to doubt and spiritual delusion because we believe that God's holding out on us. It puts us in danger because we invite the enemy of ingratitude to attack us from within. And we, here's the thing, we don't need any other dangers because our walk with Christ is along a path that's already full of pitfalls. Look at verse 8. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul is issuing for the Colossians and for us at this point this big, bold, neon warning sign. He says, see to it. And the phrase really is stronger than it appears on the surface in English. What Paul is saying is really, beware, be careful, watch out because there's danger ahead. And like the Colossians, we need warning signs because we have no idea how close we really are to danger. Since Julie and I got married, most years we would spend either Thanksgiving or Christmas away from home and visiting our extended family, either on her side or my side. And when we'd go gather with Julie's family, we typically rent a cabin somewhere between Florida and Michigan, where Julie's twin sister lives, and somewhere near where her parents live in upstate South Carolina. So one year we rented a cabin just outside of Chattanooga, right up in the mountains, right up in the hills, and we arrived there all about the same time one evening, but it was well after dark. And it was one of those nights where it wasn't just a little dark, it's like one of those new moon, dark as the plague of Egypt kind of nights. And other than the area that was lit up by the back porch light, we really couldn't see anything else. None of us had ever really been there before, from what we could see, we had a nice cabin with a nice back patio, and the property seemed to back up to a section of woods. And in the dark, we really couldn't tell much else. So as the adults greet each other there on the driveway, all the little grandkids, the cousins, nieces, and nephews, they're all running around the backyard playing, and they're having a big old time. So as they're running in and around the trees along the edge of the woods, chasing each other and playing tag, they were pretty much the only sound we could hear. But in the lulls between the kids shouting or crying over some grave injustice, as cousins will do, you could hear the splash of running water back in the woods, like the sound of a small waterfall. And hearing that sound, we were all excited to explore the woods the next day under the light of day. So the next morning, I was one of the first people up and out of the house. I didn't sleep well, you know, strange bed and all. So I decided to explore a little bit before the kids got up, see if maybe there was an adventure we could take them on when everybody got out of bed and got some breakfast. So I stepped out the back door, I walked across the back patio, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Behind our quaint little mountain cabin, there were some woods, and I could hear the sound of running water, but I was shocked what I found. Just a few feet beyond where our kids had been running and playing the night before, the earth just dropped out. I mean, I don't know whether it was a sinkhole, I don't know whether it was maybe an old mine, but there was a gaping hole just beyond the tree line. Now, there were some waterfalls, some small waterfalls that were pouring into a small pond at the bottom of this chasm, but this chasm was probably 75 feet across and probably 100 feet deep, and at least 90% of the perimeter of this death trap had no fence and no guardrail. As we chatted and the kids played in the darkness of the night before, we had no idea of the danger that was just beyond what we could see. And it was only, I believe, by the grace of God that one of our kids was, was spared falling right into that death trap. And here's the worst part. There were absolutely no warning signs. That gaping hole in Chattanooga, 
right there in the mountains. It illustrates why Paul's warning in verse 8 is so important. Because we need to beware because we're walking with Jesus through a very dangerous world. Walking through this world is treacherous. Because we're walking in the dark while deadly dangers are lurking just beyond what we can see. And that's why Paul said, see to it. Beware. Watch out. This world is dangerous. So make sure, Paul says to the Colossians and to us, that no one takes you captive. The phrase literally means to be dragged off as a prisoner as part of the spoils of war. And Paul was shouting out a warning saying that there are people in and around the Colossian church who were seeking to take them away, to enslave them to human, empty human traditions and deceitful philosophies. But Paul, he didn't really take time to outline all the possible traditions and philosophies that they needed to watch out for. He did something better. He just pointed to Jesus. He told them to not accept anything that was not according to the standard of Christ because he, he is our only standard. But know this, the threat the Colossians were facing, it doesn't hold a candle to the dangers that we face in the modern world. And we need this warning and this reminder even more than they did 2,000 years ago because we are prone to be taken captive because we forget exactly who set us free. Look at verse 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Verse 9 reminds us who Jesus really is, because the fullness of deity dwells in him. Paul is pleading with the Colossians to grasp that Christ in you, that if Christ is in you, then the fullness of God is in you, and you don't need to keep on searching. If you are saved... You have found all that you need when Christ found you. Because if you're saved, verse 10, then you have been filled in him. We are, before Christ, sinners saved by grace. And that is a perfect place for us to start to remember that we're not sufficient for anything. But if we are in Christ, his fullness is in us and available to us. And because he's sufficient, if Christ is in us, we have everything we need to do everything he's called us to do. He is sufficient to resist every temptation that might come our way. He's sufficient for us to get through every struggle and every storm. And he is sufficient to keep us safe from every snare and trap of the enemy. Because Jesus has the power, it says, over all rule and spiritual authority. So while we are sinners saved by grace, we also start each and every day with the fullness of Christ at work in us. And because of him, we can face anything this life has to offer because of what he accomplished for us and what he will accomplish in us. Look at verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, that is, the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul reminded the Colossians that, that they were no longer who they used to be. That since they had been saved, the old them, that, that old nature of who they used to be, that, that person, that nature had been buried with Christ. And someone new had been raised with him. And that the same power that raised Christ from the dead also raised them from death to life. And that we, as followers of Christ, the Colossians and us, we have access to that exact same power to live out a life that's all about Jesus because Christ is in us and he is our hope of glory. And because of that power at work in us, we are new creations. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. If you are saved, if you are a new creation, you can confidently say, I'm not who I was. Now, this is an essential truth that we simply have to grasp if we're going to live a life that's all about Jesus. Because look at the next verse, Galatians 2.20. says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we're saved, once we're saved, we are new creations, and we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. That's a stunning reality. But it really carries with it a very real struggle. 
The old has passed away and the new has come. However, we are new creations with lingering cravings. We're set free in Christ, but in spite of that, we sometimes, because of our sin nature still in us, we look back fondly on our old, on our old life in chains. And we end up falling prey to some of the same old sins. And those lingering cravings for lesser things, they leave us leading lesser lives. Lives that are not all about Jesus. Lives that, that really make us wonder what it takes to really feel like God has accepted us. Because when we're saved, we are new creations. We no longer live, but Christ lives in us. But our lives don't always reflect that reality because we forget all that Jesus has really done for us. Look at verse 13. It says, "...in you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross." He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Here we see Paul reminded the Colossian church that there was a time when they were dead in their trespasses. And trespasses equal sin. And sins are anything that doesn't align with God's will and God's ways. And sins are all the ways that we reject him. All the ways that we rebel against his rightful rule and reign in our lives. And the wages of that sin, the fitting and proper payment for any and every sin, is death. So anyone who has sinned, which is everyone, stands to reap the payment and penalty of death for their sin because of God's rightful and righteous wrath toward anything that rebels against him. So we are totally unable to make that payment. So we are in debt to God. We have a bill that we cannot pay. And he has a record of everything we've ever done. And if we think through every wrong thing we've ever done, ever thought, ever said, that list would be measured in miles. But the longer I walk with Christ, the more I realize how many sins I don't even know I'm doing at the time. And how deeply ingrained in my own sin nature there are things that I don't even really recognize yet. And I'm probably not alone in that. So as bad as we think our debt is to God, I believe it's so much worse. But catch what this verse is saying. God took our debt that we owe to him and canceled it, but not by simply ignoring it. No, he set it aside by nailing it to the cross through the suffering and the death of Jesus in our place. He paid our debt by dying our death. And if we are in him, our sin debt has been canceled and we are free. But if we're not saved, that debt is still hanging over us. If you're not saved, that debt is still hanging over you. There is still a price to pay and you'll pay it for eternity, not just through physical death, but eternal spiritual death under the fiery weight of God's wrath towards sin. Apart from the saving work of Jesus in your life, the record of debt still stands. In the United States, total consumer debt is somewhere around $14 trillion, and the average American carries a personal debt of just over $90,000. So imagine you're carrying $90,000 of debt, and there's no way you could ever pay it. The creditors, they're hot on your tail. And that you're about to lose your car, you're about to lose your house, you're about to lose everything. And then there's a knock at your door. Someone's standing there at your door, they're holding your canceled bills. They have all been paid in full and you are free of a debt you could never pay. And let me ask you, would anything be able to keep you from telling that story? Would that person have to ask you to tell other people what they've done? from social media to every social interaction. I think you and I would tell the story of the person who set us free from the debt that was going to ruin our lives. Now get this, guys. What Jesus has done for sinners like us is so much bigger than any financial bailout. My point is this. With all that Jesus has done on our behalf, Jesus shouldn't even have to ask for our lives to be all about him. And the only reason our lives aren't is because we forget what it costs to set us free. And when we forget that, we're exposed to two possible dangers, two possible traps. Look at verse 16. It says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. 
Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reasons by your sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to those things that perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. In these verses, Paul warned the Colossians about the first trap, to not let themselves be pulled back into the old religious system. The old religious system, which in this case, Paul's really referring to the Old Testament law, it was seen as the things that man had to do with perfection in order to gain God's acceptance. And in light of our lingering cravings, we have to watch out for the trap of falling back into a system of trying to bring about internal change through external effort trying to gain God's acceptance by cleaning ourselves out or cleaning ourselves up from the outside in. Paul warns the Colossians and us not to believe that our standing before a holy God is based on how perfectly we can follow external religious practices and rules are regarding, in this case, food and drinks and festivals and Sabbath. Don't let anyone convince you, though, that you need to add some extra external ingredient in order for you to secure your internal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, God does want our, uh, us, us to grow. He does want us to grow in our faith and for our external words and our deeds to change as a result of Christ being in us. But nothing we do on the outside can change the presence and power of Christ on the inside. When we're saved, our entire reality changes because Jesus moves in and he makes his home in us. And the presence of him on the inside is going to change what we do on the outside, but not the other way around. The second trap that Paul warns against in this passage is not just the old religious system. He warns them of the trap of always trying to find the next new spiritual thing. People are going to come into our lives in old times and in modern times saying, that's great you're walking with Jesus. But have you done this yet? Have you seen this new thing? Have you had this new experience? Have you heard this new teacher? They'll say, I mean, I know you think you're walking with Jesus, but you can't be walking with Jesus unless you've experienced this new thing that I've experienced. There are many within the the so-called Big C Church who would spend so much more of their time seeking spiritual experiences than they do encountering biblical truth or pursuing basic obedience. And this is so very dangerous because at the end of the day, the pursuit of these new experiences, it actually means that people are denying the sufficiency of Jesus, that Jesus is good, but he feels a little stale. I need something new. But Paul is clear. Jesus is the head and the whole body is nourished and knit together by him. And if we have Jesus, we don't need anything else. But that doesn't guarantee that we're not going to try. Look at verse 23 says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Paul is warning the Colossians against creating their own self-made religion. And he uses an unfamiliar word, asceticism, which is the practice of the denial of physical or psychological desires in order to attain a spiritual ideal or goal. Paul is combating this idea that we need to, or that we even have the ability to clean ourselves up and earn our position before God. Paul's saying, your self-made religion cannot save yourself. But that's what the Colossians were trying to do. It's at least what they were being tempted to try to do. There's this, there's this human tendency in us to get stuck in religious practices because it tells us what we have to do. Just give me the checklist of all the requirements. I'll knock them out. That way, when God calls my name, I won't have to wonder whether I've gained his acceptance because I've earned it. I completed the checklist. Religion's enticing that way. But when we try that approach, we discovered that the Old Testament system was given to reveal that we can't earn God's acceptance. We can't keep any checklist. That old system or a self-help way of thinking, it doesn't get us what we want. And we think because of that, we can come up with a better system, a system that we can keep, a system by which we can claw our way back into God's good graces, but they never, ever work. So as we close, let's circle back to the beginning. 
Have you ever felt like you're on the outside looking in, just, just longing to be accepted? Well, behind every desire of our heart to get a promotion or be embraced by a peer group is really a deeper soul desire to be accepted by our Heavenly Father. And every aspect of our earthly interactions tells us that we'll be accepted as long as we measure up. So our wounded hearts assume God must be the exact same way as everybody else. So we wear ourselves out trying to earn His acceptance, even resorting to crafting self-made religion. But self-made religion, it tells us if I can be good enough for long enough, then maybe my Heavenly Father will finally accept me. But this mentality, walking down this path, it is not walking with Jesus, and it never leads to the peace and hope and acceptance that we need. But living all about Jesus, living out the gospel, the gospel says to those who are saved, my heavenly father accepts me because of Christ in me. Because our position before God is never based on what we do, but on what Jesus has done. When Jesus declared it is finished from the cross, we can believe him, knowing that our position is secure. Self-made religion calls us to work like crazy to earn grace, but it only manages to leave us stumbling through a life of frustration and exhaustion. But the gospel allows us to work like crazy still, but this time to express gratitude, all resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So to everyone who's watching today, The good news of the gospel says to you and to me that we don't have to be on the outside looking in and we don't have to try and earn God's acceptance. If you are saved, then you are accepted by your heavenly father because of what Jesus did on your behalf. And since Christ is in you, then you don't have to search and strive anymore. And if you aren't saved today, Maybe you're joining us online today and you're not saved, but maybe today the Lord is calling you to come to Jesus. You can feel in your heart because the good news of the gospel says that you can find your hope, you can find your life, you can find the acceptance you've always desired in Christ and Christ alone. Is your life all about Jesus today? Do you want it to be? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you made a way where there was no way that the perfect sacrifice of Christ gained the acceptance for those who would be saved. And if there's anyone that's watching with us today that does not know Jesus, is not walking with him, or maybe tried religion for a while and got exhausted trying to earn their way back into God's good graces, Lord, I pray that your spirit will speak to their heart, will confront their sin, will give them hope and call them to salvation. You You would enable them to reach out to us so that they can know how to walk with Jesus and surrender their lives to him. But Lord, so many of us, we've been saved, but we still are trying to craft self-made religion, still trying to craft a way for us to feel like we've earned our place before you, to make us feel like we're accepted by you. And the enemy wants to keep us in that trap. Lord, help us grasp from your word and from the work of your spirit in our hearts and minds today. Help us to grasp that when you said it is finished, you meant it so that we can know that Christ in us is the hope of glory, that Christ in us is our guarantee of acceptance, that Christ in us is all that we need. So now we don't sit back and relax. We still work like crazy, but this time out of gratitude and not out of desperation. This time we work like crazy and we serve you with all that we have because we can do it from a position of resting in in the sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be a people this week who will love enough to share the good news as we share our lives as well. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey, Good Life, Uh, one last time, we just want to thank you for being here with us, for sharing life, even through a screen. Um, We just encourage you to connect with us as much as you're able to, whether it's on social media or, or on our website at goodlifefl.com or, or shoot us an email at info at goodlifefl.com. And I know that we say that a lot, but we really do mean it. I mean, if we're not meeting together in person and, you, and you're at home watching online, we still want to share life as much as we're able to. We still want to hear from you. We still want to be able to pray for you, whether it's over the phone or over social media, whatever it may be, we want to be the body of Christ together. So, so reach out to us if you have any prayer requests or concerns or, or, or comments or whatever it is we want to hear from you. Um, and. and 
If you're interested in coming back into service in person, we are meeting at the venue. Um, every Sunday we're meeting there and, and feel free to check out on our website where you can get registered to sign up for that so that we can maintain the social distancing, uh, the rules and the guidelines and those sorts of things. But but I, I would encourage you that if you're considering coming back, just, just log on, get signed up and also be praying about whether or not God is calling you back to meet again. Um, I know it's a crazy time and some people don't feel comfortable or some people are traveling, but I know there's also a group of us who aren't really sure if we want to, it's easy to stay online, but I would encourage you as the Good Life family that if you are considering it, be praying about it and, and, and look to be meeting in person if you're able to. We would really love to see you. So thanks again, guys. Look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday.